Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled How to Future Proof Your Teaching. I'm Sarah McFarlane, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's event. This is the first of four events in the Teaching Anatomy and Physiology series, which has been made possible by 80 Instruments and the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society. So a big thank you to them for their support. Joining us today, we're fortunate to have Dr. Tony McKnight, the Director of Education at 80 Instruments, and an expert in the field. He will discuss different formats for delivering course material online, the tools that are available, and some specific examples of how virtual learning can be just as interactive and efficient as in-person teaching methods. Now, before we get started, I would like to share just a few housekeeping notes to help you get the most out of the webinar. First, this webinar is being recorded and resources will be made available following the event. Next up, if the webinar panels look too big or too small, you can zoom in or out in your internet browser to adjust the viewing area. You can also resize some of these panels or make the media panel full screen. Please send questions, thoughts, and comments to us via the ask a question box next to the media window at any time. You can also take a look at the resources panel where you'll find a few links associated with today's event. We'll also be running a number of audience polls throughout the webinar and a survey at the end, so please chime in and share your perspectives with us. And finally, if you do happen to experience any technical issues during the event, the easy fix tends to be a simple refresh of the webinar auditorium page by refreshing your browser. This should successfully reestablish your streaming connection so you can hear us clearly. However, if this doesn't work for you and you continue to have issues, use the Ask a Question box to communicate your issue with our team and we'll help you to get back up and running. So, without further ado, I will like to launch the first poll. So this poll is, do you currently utilize any of the following approaches in your teaching? Blended learning, flipped classrooms, both of the above or none of the above? And I'll just give you guys a couple seconds to answer that before we move on. Seeing some pretty good responses, so thank you so much for your participation. All right, awesome. Give everyone a couple more seconds here and we will move on. Cool, okay, so. The next poll is, in light of the pandemic, which of the following best describes your current approach to teaching? In-person teaching, remote slash online teaching, a hybrid of these two, or I'm not an educator. So we'll give everyone a couple more seconds to answer that. And thank you again for your participation. Awesome, okay. We're gonna close that poll and move on. So finally, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Tony McKnight. Tony, it's a pleasure to have you with us today and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. So good afternoon to most of you. It's uh, morning the next day here in New Zealand. The sun is shining but I'm sitting inside working, as usual, actually. So what I'm going to do today is really share with you my thoughts about how we can cope with the situation we presently have and how, if we design our courses uh, appropriately, we will be able to switch uh, easily, readily between online or um, fully integrated uh, campus courses with virtually no changes at all in the material that we're going to teach. So I have spent about 40 years in biomedical research and in teaching physiology to students. And for the last 20 years, I've been developing teaching materials for physiologists, really um, trying to create what I would love to have been able to do when I was teaching myself. And I'm going to illustrate this talk with some of the things I've been working on 
using the LT platform that I use, and I'm presenting the talk in that platform. But I want to emphasize to you that it's the principles that I'm going to talk about that are important. Um, I'm using the platform to show you the principles. And I have two major messages for you, which I've learned through trial and error. The first is that you can actually have students best understand physiology if you ask questions. You can teach all of physiology by asking appropriate questions. And the second thing is, if you change the way you deliver your course, you must explain to students at the very beginning what you're doing and why you're doing them it, and assure them that they will still learn because they have an inbuilt fear of going away from what their past experience has told them they'll succeed in doing. If they're very good at sitting through conventional lectures, conventional labs, conventional exams, they know they'll succeed there, they don't really want to change. And so it's important if you do change that right from the start, you explain why you're doing it, the benefits they're going to get, and assure them that it works. Now, I won't spend much time on this. You know better than I do the consequences of the virus. You also know the consequences and the disruption that this has caused and the problems it caused for the universities, for the teachers yourselves, and also for students. And those are some of the common themes that come up when we talk about how things have changed in tertiary education as a consequence of the virus. But this has also given us a great opportunity to rethink and recast what, how, and why we teach. And for years, everyone has said, oh, well, we want to uh, produce lifelong learners, ability to apply information, and etc. in the real world. These are what all departments said. But we weren't really that good at doing it because we really were still focusing on and delivering passive learning. And it's through active learning that you can really achieve these things. So here is a great opportunity for us to really move away from the passive learning to active learning. And I have four, what I call four E's of learning or four E's of education. And these should apply equally to you as teachers and to the students. Learning needs to be effective. And by that, I mean that the students need to feel that they are really learning. And you need to feel that what you're delivering is really achieving learning. It's effective learning. It also has to be efficient. There is nothing worse in any course than students and yourselves spending hours doing things that are both perceive, you perceive are not really very useful. Time is really pre uh, precious and you need to be efficient in the use of time. Learning needs also to be everlasting. It mustn't be because I have an exam in a week's time, I have to learn this. If all we're doing is saying to students, learn it for the exam, they will certainly both learn it and forget it. It's not an appropriate model. To, to teach that way. So we've got to emphasize that what they're learning is for their future use. It's everlasting. And finally, for both you and the students, learning needs to be exciting. If it's not exciting, you're not going to do it. If you're not excited, you won't be motivated. So we need to try to make learning exciting for both you and the students. Now, here's a question I want you to think about. What is the most important factor in student learning? Well, you will hopefully have come to the same answer I have come to. You are. The teacher is the single most important uh, person activity in student learning. That's why they come to universities. That's why they don't simply sit online and watch lectures given by some world expert in some remote uh, location. And it's really, really important 
that you teach your course, not someone else's, that you take whatever people like us, textbooks, etc., provide, and you modify it, you adapt it, you turn it into the material that you want to teach, not something that someone's given you to teach. And nothing works unless you believe in what you're doing and the students believe that you believe in what you are doing because they know when you're not really very confident about doing something or whether you're doing it because you've been told to do it rather than because you believe in doing it. And the other really important thing is that when the students put time and effort and commitment into their study, it's appropriately rewarded by examination systems which actually fairly test their learning. And I'll come to that at the end. So there are four traditional course components in courses like physiology. We have lectures, we have tutorials, we have laboratories, we have tests and exams. And I'm going to look at each of those and see how we can change and adapt them uh, for active learning and for future proofing teaching. Now, before the virus, most people would get up and give a lecture in our university and almost certainly many other universities, these were all videoed. Now you've got video lectures. People are videoing the lectures and the students are watching them remotely. Now there's a number of problems with video lectures. One thing that happened very obviously in our situation is when the lectures are put online and uh, videoed, students don't come to the lectures and the lecture attendance has decreased in many courses to about 20% of the students being there live, and the rest would watch the videos. That may or may not have been a bad thing. But the problem with all these videoed lectures is it's all passive learning, and the students are using it for passive learning. They're playing the lecture two, three or four times while they think of something else, in the hope that somehow, miraculously, what's being said on the lectures will be remembered by them long enough to be regurgitated when it's necessary. So we don't need to do this any longer. And so in our future proofed course, we should replace these lectures with what I'm going to call uh, online lecture tutorials or lectorials, we can call them. Now, I'm going to leave you for a moment to read this, which I think is very important, about what lectures are really doing. And so I'll give you a moment just to read that through. Well, I hope that's enough time uh, for you to read it. One of the problems in doing this without being able to see your audience is, of course, you don't know. But in general, as you all know, you can read off the screen three times faster than I could read that to you. So hopefully you've all read it now and hopefully it makes sense to you. That this is, in fact, a very good summary of the problems that we have if we believe that somehow our lecturing is achieving what we perhaps hope it will. So let's replace these traditional lectures and our tutorials with this lectorial structure. One of the problems at the moment that I always had 
was I would run tutorials, but the students never prepared for them. And so when I went into the tutorial and would say, well, um, what do you want me to talk about to, today about, let's say, the respiratory system? No one said anything. And in the end, after trying to get them to say things, you end up giving many lectures again in the tutorials. So the tutorial structure, as I experienced it, and you may have been luckier, uh, doesn't work. So that's why I'm saying let's combine what we do with the lectures and what we do in tutorials and turn them into an online lectorial and save our present face-to-face -face time, which is very precious, for more uh, useful activities, problem-solving sessions, flipped classroom, whatever you want to call that. I'll come back to that. Now, one of the things that we also know doesn't work is just getting students to read things. You can say, read chapter X in the textbook, read an exciting paper, just read. And again, I want to give you a moment to read this comment uh, from Andy Matushek. So I don't know if, if that's how you feel uh, about textbooks, but whether you feel like that or not about books, increasingly I'm told, and my observations um, support this, the students aren't reading anyway. So that uh, you can't rely upon to simply giving students material to read and assume they will read it and come prepared to tutorials. So now let's look at how to design these lectorials. Design each of them around selected key concepts. Introduce each concept by one or two simple questions before you uh, show them your own short video about a particular concept. To read again here what David Robson says about learning. So I think this is a really very important point. Certainly in physiology, the students know far more than they think or know they know. And if you give them a chance to think about what they know about a subject before you tell them anything, then they will often retrieve useful information. But even if they don't, as it says here, they'll be primed to learn the material better. So. We start then with one or two questions that should help them retrieve information. Then if you want to use a video, make your own. Don't use someone else's videos. Students want and need to see and hear you. And now with um, phones, it's very easy to make simple videos and you don't need to make them up to a professional standard. The students aren't expecting that. They just want to hear you talk for a few minutes about something to give them guidance about their learning. So you talk about a concept for a couple of minutes. You don't have to give a lot of detail because you follow that with questions that test the student understanding of the concept and give them in the questions, as I'll illustrate to you, the material that they need to learn. Now, when you ask questions, it's really important that immediately the students get quality feedback about the question. Did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? 
what did they get wrong? It's also important in learning that you provide repetition and rehearsal of the information they're learning. So it's always a good thing to ask the same question about the same concept in several different ways, using several different formats of questions. And I can illustrate that. And then after they've done that, you can move to the next concept. So you can plan out a session for the student, which might take them one to two hours, during which time they will cover all and more of the material that you would have given in that lecture and in the tutorial material associated with the lecture. The other important and useful thing that you have when you uh, teach in this way the students can form groups and collaborate and learn together. And there's no doubt that peer learning is a really powerful a way for students to learn. Discussing together the questions, working on what they think are the answers uh, together is very powerful. And all that's possible with the online learning. <clears throat> so now I'm going to illustrate to you a range of questions that are now available to use. We no longer have, as, as we used to have to do, uh, either have short essay uh, written questions or MCQs. There's a whole range of question types. And I've listed them there, some of them there, and I'll put ticks beside the ones where you can set up the computer to mark them. Because the last thing you want to do, if you're going to set a number of uh, short tests, as I'll come to, is to have to spend a lot of time marking all those manually. Computer marked questions are very useful and a lot of them can be computer marked. Um, some can't be because you can't <coughs> predict what the students are going to write, but certainly some can. So let's now look at some of these question types. And the first I want to come to is this business of images. Now, the first image there is a textbook image showing uh, a G protein um, cascade. Now, students can look at that, but where do they start? What do they learn? What are they trying to do with that image? It may illustrate the concept, but just looking at the image, it's really um, complicated and will tend to confuse them. Now, I can construct a question containing all of that same information and get the students to label but there's a lot going on in that image and a lot of labels. And again, it would be very challenging to do that. So it's very good when you use images, which are at all complicated, to break them into segments and get the students to label one segment at a time. And so I'm not going to try to get this right, but they can drag headings here and they can Put something here I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm really not reading this but I've got that wrong anyway <laughs> uh, but, but then when they do this they can get immediate feedback about whether they were correct or not and they can get associated text discussing what happened and then they can go to the next stage in this and they can do the labeling again and then they can go to the next stage and do the labeling again. So they're building up their information stage by stage. And then they can test whether they've understood it all by labeling that whole image. So they come back to the whole image, but only after they have broken it down into manageable small chunks. So labeling images is a really powerful way to get students to engage in the material and interact with it. And I think nowadays that you should never give students any image that they don't interact with. You can also use this labeling for other uh, things. For instance, here you can label this, you can get students to think about cardiac output and what goes on, where they get vasoconstriction, venous return, and they can arrange these. And again, and I'll just dump something in here. I'm not really reading this at all. <clears throat> but they can uh, label that and then again they can get detailed feedback so they're thinking about it they're doing something and then they're reading about it but they're reading to see 
whether they were right and what they did. And they can have as many goes at this if you set it up this way as you want. So eventually they will get it right and they can play around and uh, play about until they get it right. So that's labeling of images and labeling. Now, another really powerful type of question is category questions. And category questions are useful because students effectively read, in reading the question, they read in the important points that you want them to learn. And it's really important when you construct these that the ones that are incorrect will be obviously incorrect to a student who's thinking. And mostly when I construct these, uh, eight out of 10 of the answers will be correct and one or two will be incorrect. I pass, uh, pass it in that direction. And so effectively, again, I'm not going to try to get this right, but the students can drag these in here. I know the answer to this one, so I will actually get it, most of this right. But not quite all of it. And you can see again that they get immediate feedback and they now read effectively through reading this here and reading this, they have read what they would have read in their textbook. Only they've read it thinking about it, not simply reading it. And they've tried to understand it and get it correct as they go through. And you can use these category questions to do other things like decide from these which affect heart rate, which affect stroke volume, which affect both. You can get them to decide with, with these hormones, the symptoms that you get from hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism. They're very, very um, versatile types of questions. And I'm a really a big fan for category questions. I think it's a, a way of, of students actively learning a lot of material. Then you can also get them to interact with images uh, and annotate them. So here there's an image and I'm asking them to show me where water is reabsorbed in the nephron in the presence of vasopressin. And again, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but I go to annotate, I can select arrows and I can draw arrows and I can show where I think water is reabsorbed. Now, some of that's going to be wrong. I know that already. And when I've done the whole thing, I can check my answer and again get feedback about it and another example here where they can decide the differences between fetal and adult hemoglobin in oxygen carrying capacity so again you can create a lot of these questions and, and test a lot of information and a lot of understanding through getting students to annotate but as you saw the annotate question has to be marked by you. You can't computer mark it because the computer can't tell whether or not the students are going to put arrows in particular places. Now, another very useful type of question is matching and ordering questions. In physiology, there's a lot of time when you ask for how things function and you get them to think through a material and you can hear, you can get them to order put these in a logical order from the acetylcholine being released to the muscle contraction. You can also get them to define things. You can just get them to define which of these is the appropriate um, description of the antibody. It's a tremendous, again, a tremendous variety of questions you can do through matching and ordering questions. So in summary, your lectorial becomes your online resource for student learning. And we use the time that you used to use for teaching what you've done now in the lectorial for problem solving sessions for the students. So let's come to problem solving sessions now. If you've got the luxury and you're on campus and you've got enough tutors, the ideal problem solving sessions are small group sessions with individual tutors who are properly trained to run the sessions. If you haven't got that and you want to use, use problem solving, your flipped classroom 
structure uh, will work too. And if you do flipped classroom, I would form groups of up to six students and have them working as groups so that you can have even 200 students in that room, but you've got groups and the groups are working together and you're interacting with the groups, not with the individual students. Now, if you can't do this on campus and you have to do distance learning, then again, I think it's very useful to get the students to form their own groups and discuss the questions. And then when you have your online session through Zoom or however else you're doing it, you are able to interact with those groups rather than having to interact with every single uh, student. Now, one of the really important features that you can do now with online learning is analytics. And analytics is going to enable you to see which students are having problems. It's also going to enable you to see which questions are proving more difficult. So that when you come to your problem solving sessions, you will know from the performances of the students in the lectorial that some areas are, uh, they're spending more time on, they're having more difficulty with, and you can construct your questions for their problem solving session to deal with and cover those issues. And so you can provide additional questions to extend the student learning in those sessions. Now let's come and quickly look at laboratories. Now traditionally laboratories are an essential component of physiology courses. So what do you do when you have to have fully remote uh, learning? So the first thing to be clear about is that the laboratories should be used to teach for the students to learn what they can't learn elsewhere. So this is a list of some of the things that you can learn in laboratories that you can't learn elsewhere. And you could no doubt add to that list and some of those things you would think um, are more important than others. But of all of them, I think biological variability is really important. I'm sure you've all had this experience with, with students new to physiology who come up to you and say, my goodness, what's wrong with me? My blood pressure is 110, 70, not 120, 80. So biological variability is really, uh, to learn about that and to understand that is very important. So those are all things that you can do with laboratories. And I think increasingly we are moving to human laboratories for a whole variety of reasons. I think the main reason is that with modern transducers and electronics, you can do a lot of really good human experiments and the students really love to see their own physiological data. So the human experiments tend to be really enjoyed by students. They're also cost effective and they overcome some of the ethical issues that people have had in the past with um, animal work. So for introductory uh, physiology courses, I would always now um, move to a human uh, laboratory experiment uh, base. Now let's look at and compare the learning outcomes if you can run live laboratories with the students, if you have to run online laboratories, or if you move to simulations of laboratories. And I've made a little list here of those unique laboratory learning things, and I've graded them according to their uh, relative um, uh, ability of these different uh, types to deliver them. So obviously, only live laboratories deliver students' own physiology. Online laboratories where students analyze pre-recorded data will show you biological variability and to some extent some of these others, but not as well. Obviously, experimental difficulty isn't shown. <coughs> the way we normally run uh, laboratories, which are more like cookbook things, scientific method isn't shown particularly well. The one thing that simulations do better 
is extend observation. So that, for instance, if I'm doing a blood pressure lab and the students are measuring their own blood pressure, there's no way I can now remove blood from them and show them how they respond to loss of blood. But I can, through simulations, show them the physiological changes that will occur with blood loss. And so there is a place for simulations or for pre-recorded data from animals of blood loss, which can be incorporated into laboratories. But other than that, if you can't run live laboratories, try to deliver through their online learning the laboratory data and get them to play with it and analyze it because they can get most of the experience uh, that they would have had from the live laboratory that way. Now, one of the really good things about um, students recording their own data is you can get patient data recorded in the same way and the students can compare their own data with patient data. So for health science stu uh, students and potential health science students, this is really very powerful motivation for them. And this is just an example of a comparison for heart rate variability for a student breathing normally and then deeply and looking at the variability in heart rate beat to beat with a person with a a sympathetic peripheral neuropathy who has no uh, autonomic innovation, effective autonomic innovation of his heart. Now, this person shows no variability. And breathing deeply doesn't change that. The blue circles are breathing deeply. Whereas you can see there's enormous variability, even normally, and then breathing deeply produces much greater variability. So this type of thing is a really great way to get students to think about their learning and effectively see how in the future they will apply what they're learning to understand uh, patient problems. Now, I think that the future of laboratories for health science students, particularly for nursing medical students, is not customized uh, laboratories any longer. Um, technology is moving on, uh, transducers are becoming uh, cheaper, it's becoming easier to make these recordings, and I believe in future uh, student laboratories won't exist for the health science students outside of their small group tutorial interactions. I can imagine that they'll be having their small group discussion, they'll be going through those lectorial uh, material, and when it comes up, you'll be able to simply say to them, OK, let's now look and see how your heart rate varies. Let's have a look now and see how your respiratory function varies. And let's compare that with the patient's problem that we're discussing at the time. And the laboratory will just simply occur around the uh, case. So they'll still have the laboratory experience, but it will be seamlessly built into their learning experience. So my motto here is take the laboratory to the students, not the students to the laboratory. Now, finally, the exam problem, because we all know that what really happens in our courses is that the students want to pass the exam and that governs everything they learn. So we hope that we teach, they learn and they understand. But in actual fact, a lot of the time, the understanding is short circuited by the examination and the students are learning for the exam rather than learning to understand. So how are we going to solve this? How are we going to change the student's behavior? So my present thinking is no single major examination. We will have analytics. We will know which students are performing well. We will know which students are struggling. We'll be putting in interventions very early in the course for the students who are having problems. We'll be running regular small tests. 
using the questions that can be computer marked simply to encourage students to that they are making progress. The students, if you construct these tests properly and they're doing the, te the course properly, the lecturers properly, will pass these exams and will see they're making progress. And that's really important. Students need to believe they're making progress and that encourages them to keep learning. As I said, you can interview the students who are having problems and then simply have one or two larger tests that utilize a mix of the questions that the students have been working on during the course. And those questions can be exactly the same format as the students have been doing, but you can there change the answers effectively. So that if they had a, uh, a question which was a category question and where in their learning most of the answers were right, you can change the answers so most of the answers, for instance, might be wrong. So the students are going to have to think they can't wrote learn all the questions they, they studied in the hope that they will all emerge and they will just be able to recall from memory. You can overcome that. You can create an exam using the same structure, but one which they can never have wrote, learned or studied for, for uh, specific answers for. So this is my summary of our future proofed course. Lecturals, which can occur, occur online, Problem solving sessions, which hopefully are a mix of uh, online and flipped classroom small group sessions. Designed so they can be delivered on campus or online at any moment. Laboratories designed so, so that if you do have to go to distance learning, the students can still effectively do those laboratory uh, experiments in the sense they can analyze and critique the real data. And for on-campus laboratories, a just-in-time approach where you build in your laboratory into their small group learning sessions. And for course assessment, of a, as I've said, no single major exam and instead uh, analytics, regular small test interviews and one or two larger tests. Now, the real question is, of course, does this approach work? Is it worthwhile going to this sort of effort to rethink, revamp your course? Are you really going to achieve a better outcome? Well, you will. I'm now very confident. We have people who are now using this approach and they're finding the following things. The average grades in the formative exams are increasing by around 5% or more. Now, the very best students don't improve their grades because they can't. They're already really at the top. The people at the very bottom won't necessarily improve their grades because they're at the bottom because they have personal issues, they've got motivational issues. They're not really in the right course. But the large bulk of the students we are finding are moving up a great a grade point so this if they were a c plus student they're now becoming a b or b plus student and what we're also finding is that the students are really satisfied the students are really enjoying their courses more they really like this approach because they're getting constant feedback about their understanding are they progressing are they understanding are they learning and the people running these courses now believe that the students have a greater depth of understanding of material and are able to use it constructively in problem solving sessions and they're finding that the tutorials now the students are participating they're talking they're involved and they're ready to go more deeply into their um, problems so yes it really does work and here's just one example and i was really blown away by this if i was making it up i would never have made it up uh, to turn out like this. Here's a first year physiology course for health science students, nursing midwifery students. There's 70 to 150 students in each course intake. So it's a large course. The students range in age from 18 to 50s, school leavers, people coming back to education, perhaps really for the first time at the age of 50 to relearn. There's a mix of races, there's a mix of educational backgrounds. 
And before they started in this uh, course with the blended learning approach, about a third of the students failed this course and the average mark was just under 50%. Now with the same examination type, and that's important for the comparison, there are hardly any failures. And in the last um, course that was run, just one person failed and the average marks are now in the mid to high 60s. The students are loving the course, they're enjoying it and they're succeeding. And I think that this really encourages me to believe that changing to this type of approach really will work you'll enjoy it more and your students will be getting greater satisfaction and a greater uh, outcome so thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to talk with you i hope you've enjoyed it i hope perhaps you've learned a little bit and uh, i'm very happy indeed to answer any questions Thank you so much for that awesome presentation, Tony. Um, before we move on to our Q&A session, we are going to run a really quick poll, just one more poll. So this poll is, which technologies do you currently use in your teaching? Um, so we have equipment for physiological recordings, cloud-based technologies and online textbooks, simulations, mannequins, or none of the above. And please select all that apply. And after you've um, answered this poll, if you do have any questions for Tony, please use the Ask a Question panel uh, to relay those to our team and we will try and answer as many as we can. All right, um, thanks so much for participating in that poll. We're still getting a couple answers flying in. So please um, finish up quickly and then we will move on to our Q&A session. Okay, Tony, do we have you back now? Yes, yes, I'm here. Great. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, we yep. can. Um, so we are going to kick off our Q&A with our very first question. And so this question is, how do you prevent cheating on virtual exams slash tests? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. And, and um, I think there are two parts to it. And, and I'm not, I don't really know the answer. So hopefully other people will, will tell me, but I think that you've got to know that the student who is sitting the exam is the student you think is the student sitting the exam. And uh, there are various techniques to know that. But that, of course, is essential. But other than that, I'm not really so worried about teaching because I uh, cheating because I believe let, let, let's imagine we do this. We say to ourselves, we're going to have a two hour exam. And in that exam, we put a large number of questions. And we have this mix of questions and we reckon uh, we, we get the timing and you have to think about the timing, but you get the timing such that if a student doesn't know the answer and if they then go and do a Google search and they try to find all the answers, they're never going to finish the exam. So all they're going to actually do is ensure that they can't pass it. Because there's no way, I, I mean, I've done this myself. I've actually taken those category questions, for instance, when I was making them. And I could spend three hours trying to find an answer to just one of those questions and be sure it was correct. It's, 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 it's not easy. It's easy enough if you get a very simple question to go and do a Google search. But if you've got five or six choices, you've got to decide is each of these correct or incorrect. And you try to do a Google search about each one, you're going to be taking half an hour. Whereas if you know it, you can do it in two minutes. So right. I think if we construct these properly, that cheating is not necessarily going to be a problem. That makes sense. Um, and a great suggestion for people who are looking for ways to um, kind of supplement their online tests with um, questions that are not so easily Googleable, as I've heard it referred to. So thanks for that answer, yeah. Tony. 
Um, we've got another question here from Valerie. Valerie says, I see how this could work for physiology. I have a new anatomy course, which has little to no physiology in it. This is obviously more memorization than anything else. What techniques could work with this type of course? Well, 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 thank you, Valerie, for that, because effectively, I believe exactly the same techniques will work. And in fact, on my list of to do things is to create exactly the same material for anatomy as we've created for physiology. Um, there is There are anatomy laboratories available for online learning, but not yet these types of questions. But you, you can create these yourselves. It, 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 Creating these questions is actually very, well, the mechanics of doing them is very simple. Uh, the, the, the time is taken by thinking about good questions. But in anatomy particularly, you've got lots of labeling. So you can do lots of labeling questions. So I think exactly the same approach. And I think all science subjects are learned best through students answering questions. And at the moment, I'm actually working on um, a similar approach for chemistry. And I'm learning a lot of chemistry uh, doing this, actually. So I hope that answers your question, Valerie. I think it does. Um, so thank you for that answer, Tony. Uh, we have another question here for uh, you, Tony. So um, this person has asked, during COVID, human experiments in person, especially about respiratory function, aren't possible. Do you have any suggestions on how to bring these labs and these experiments to students virtually? Well, I mean, I, I can answer that in terms of what I know our company does. And I think other companies have done the same thing too, perhaps less elegantly. But it, within our platform, you can carry out the experiments. And so what we have done for the respiratory experiments, including all the others, is we have recorded what we call as um, typical data. We haven't tried to make it perfect. It's, the it's exactly what the students would record. And if the students can't do the experiment in person, you can give them access to this online and they can actually look at the data. They can see how the experiment was done. They can then look at real data and they can do all the analysis as though it was their data. So it's not as good as being in the lab and getting their own data, but all the analysis, all the thinking, all the questions, the graphs, etc., are exactly what they would get if they were in the lab. So yes, that is the, the best solution uh, to that problem that I know. That makes sense, makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we do have another question here. This question is from Paul. Uh, what are some platforms that allow you to do some of these methods such as matching that were shown in the presentation? Well, well Paul, I, 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 I would love to be able to answer that by telling you names of other platforms. But actually, I haven't researched that. I, we have created this for, for what I wanted. So it's really tailor-made to the way I wanted to teach. Uh, I'm sure there are other platforms out there. I'm sure there are other ways of doing this. But I, I can't, honestly, I can't tell you uh, what, what they are. Um, I'm sure others will be able to tell you answers to that. But, but I can't. I, I only know what I've worked with, really. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, Paul, in case you missed it, um, the program that Tony showed you during his presentation today is called LT. It's made by a company called AD Instruments, who um, has sponsored this series. So if you want more information about um, this software and um, how to use it, there is a link in the resources panel to the LT um, portion of the AD Instruments website. So you can go there and check it out. Um, we have another question here. This question is from Peter. Um, in regards to the example that you gave at the end of your to uh, presentation, Tony, about um, students having better performance in the um, virtual version of the course, 
Um, how do you know that the better performance isn't just because the course is less rigorous? Um, is there any way to standardize um, the online versus in-person courses? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a concern always of whether you're really making it a, a, a proper comparison. But this, um, the results I showed you there are interesting because over several years, this course is now around this last uh, course I showed you, and it was taught entirely on campus until, and this is a New Zealand course, until uh, the April last year, they suddenly had to go for about six weeks onto virtual uh, online learning. And so, <coughs> as far as we can tell, the course worked equally well either way. Um, I, I think that's the only real answer I can give you. I, I, m most of our data uh, about the success of this is coming actually more from people's experience using it on campus than online. But the online results are, are fitting exactly with the on-campus results. And the same exam has been used for both. So I think it's probably pretty, uh, it's pretty fair to say that the results are comparable, whichever way you do it. That's great. Um, we've got another question <coughs> here. Uh, this question is um, from Liam. Uh, lots of universities use their own systems to track grades and assignment submissions. Does LT integrate easily with any of these types of systems? It integrates easily with um, Canvas and Blackboard and Moodle. Uh, and those are the major systems that are used. Uh, and we're working to, to make it integrate even better for the future. It's one of the things that we are, we're working on. But yes, it, it does. I mean, it has to, because obviously you don't want students having to and staff having to use two separate platforms and that don't communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and so we've got another question here. Um, this question is from Virginia. Um, in small learning groups, we often see that some students work very hard and others barely contribute. Do you see differences in the exam performance between these different kinds of students with um, your methods that you described? That's, a, that's an excellent question, uh, Virginia. And I can't answer that because I haven't seen any data that analyzes performance in that way. Um, my, my guess, it's, a, it's very interesting because I had exactly the same problem. I used to run tutorials and you can get one or two dominant people who answer everything and everyone else sits and says nothing. Sometimes it's simply because, in fact, often it's because they're shy. Uh, I, sometimes it's a cultural thing. We, we had um, classes with Asian um, New Zealanders mixed together and some of the Asian students never said very much at all. But in the exams, they did just fine. So I think it's a really difficult but very interesting question. And it will be very interesting to explore in greater depth. It would be an excellent research um, uh, project for you, actually, to, to try to, to, uh, to sort that out. Mm -hmm. And we have one last question here, just to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, this question comes from Denise. Um, she asks, what are five skills a teacher um, who wants to implement these um, techniques, um, what are five skills that um, this teacher needs to develop? And which of the interventions would you recommend starting with? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a very, very uh, difficult question for me to answer. But, but, I, but I think I'm not sure that I can say five skills, but I'll say that there's one thing that the teacher has to develop and that is you have to be confident and about yourself and your understanding and you have to be confident to say to students when they ask you a question i don't know the answer to that because that's the scariest thing for teachers when they shift from telling the students everything to effectively assisting the students to learn it's that 
fear that you're going to get asked questions that you can't answer. Well, it's inevitable. I mean, I can't answer most questions I get asked because you just don't necessarily retain it and you need to go and refresh it. And I always used to say to the students that the best answer you can give me when I ask you a question is, I do not know. If you then go on and say, but I will go and find out. And so I think that one of the real skills you need is the ability to basically have the students believe in you and trust you. So when you say, look, I don't know, let's go and find out and next time we'll discuss this. They all think that's great. I'm really being helped here because my teacher is, is, is helping me to learn. So I would say that is the major skill. If, if I was going to start anywhere, I would start by creating the lectorials. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm not wanting to promote uh, uh, our product particularly, but we now have a collection of almost 4,000 questions that you can draw upon and put into your own course. So there's a, there's a lot of material out there now already done for you that you can go through and put into your course, create the course you want using that material. If you don't want to make videos, I don't think you need to have the videos. The videos are, uh, are um, to some extent, window dressing, and they're a way to make sure that the students realize that it's your course. But you can create the lectorials without the videos. And that would take, that would be the relatively easiest thing to do, the simplest thing to do. And I'd probably start there because that would make the biggest difference to the student learning in, in my experience. That's awesome. Um, all right. So with that, I want to um, thank Tony um, for your wonderful presentation and your fantastic insights today um, in the Q&A session. And I hope everyone got as much out of it as I did. Um, as someone who went through um, some portions of virtual teaching um, when I did my undergrad. So thank you again, Tony, for that um, awesome presentation. Uh, thank you. All right. So um, before you go, we just wanted to thank everyone else for attending and being here live. Again, the slides and a recording of today's webinar will be available soon. So look out for an email from us giving you access to the video recording in the near future. And with that access, um, AD Instruments will also be sharing Tony's presentation with you all. So keep an eye out for that email and that invitation from AD Instruments to view um, the lecture on LT. Um, before you go, we want you to participate in this survey. So please, um, after this webinar is over, you will be redirected to a page to um, take a survey. And we'd love to hear your feedback on the webinar and some future topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. And finally, if you do have any questions for Tony still, um, please feel free to submit them now using the Ask a Question panel, and we'll make sure to forward them along to Tony. And in closing, thank you again for taking part in this webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon. And lastly, if you're curious about the upcoming uh, events in this series, um, here is a quick summary of the next three events. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you at those events as well. Um, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you.